Welcome to AFSPA Talks, a production of the American Foreign Service Protective Association with Chief Operating Officer Kyle Longton. Be sure to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast channel. Enjoy the episode. Hi, and welcome to another episode of AFSPA Talks. I'm Kyle Longton, and along with me is... Hannah Wolfart. Hana, we're continuing our series on back to school this week because it's still August and we still have school starting up around the country. And this is still, it's it's not back to school for you and me, as we talked about last week, but it is for at least one member of your family, right? Yeah, my mom actually is going back to school. She's a first grade teacher in Massachusetts, um, public school, and she's getting ready to go back there. Everybody's going to be completely masked and everything, but it, this is her first time back last year, they didn't go back into school. Oh, so they were virtual all last year. Yeah. Okay. And at first grade, she's going to have kids who've never been in a a classroom before, I guess, even if they did kindergarten, it would have been virtual. Yeah. It's crazy because she's normally gets kids that can already read and have those basic skills, but this year it's going to be starting like from the kindergarten basics. Now, did you have her listen? I mean, Kara had some, some recommendations last week. Did you have her listen to to the episode? I did. She enjoyed that very good. much. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. Um, yeah, I've got, I, I, we, we've talked before. I've got my mother-in-law is a, a second grade teacher and, and um, I've got grandmothers and others in my family who, who taught for decades. So um, never in the virtual environment, just, just my mother-in-law. And she did go back in person last year, but it was a, a different experience. So I wish good luck to your mom. Um, Thank you. And you'll keep us updated on how that's going for her. Um, when does she go back? Um, August. I think the teachers go back the 20th and then the kids come back the following week. I also just wanted to mention, Kyle, that our back to school blog is up as well. You can find that on our website at afspa.org slash blog. And it's titled A Safe Return to the Classroom. That came out on August 5th, uh, where we discuss a safe return to the classroom and going back into the classroom during a pandemic, what that's going to look like for children and how to keep your child safe. Okay. Fingers crossed for all of them and for all the the teachers and students and the parents who are supporting them across the country. Um, And we've got another conversation with a teacher this week. And before we get into the specifics there, um, I want to say a special thank you to um, a friend of mine for many years, um, Diane Gibbs. She is the FEA director for um, the stateside uh, teachers, so the Federal Education Association director for uh, DDIS that we talked about last week. So she's she's the president, essentially, of the stateside, um, the the CONUS teachers, if you will. Um, and she's been a great friend and a great support um, and, and partner to to ASPA through the years. And and we've done some presentations together. So Diane, thank you because she put us in touch with Kara Rosenfeld from last week, and also with our guest this week, who is Anitra Smith Lincoln. Anitra Smith-Lincoln is currently a middle school teacher on Fort Bragg teaching eighth grade U.S. history. She has a total of 18 years of experience ranging from grade three to grade 12. Um, She did her undergraduate and her law school education at Arizona State University. Um, And she's currently the president of the local union there on Fort Bragg. She is married to an army veteran and she has three children, um, a nine-year-old and like me, twin five-year-old. So we, we commiserated about that a bit. Um, But she also um, was in a previous career, a juvenile probation officer. And so as a middle school teacher, I'm I'm thinking maybe that experience comes in handy from time to time, but she's going to share with us some of her experience um, in teaching virtually and then coming back in person next year. So maybe some more advice for your mom, Hannah. Yeah, definitely. It's always good to get another perspective, especially with older kids. Just, yeah, just another level. So um, uh, Anitra is a runner. Um, I think she has that in common with you, Hannah. Um, yep. Yep. So that, that is wonderful. I, I hope to join you there someday, but in the meantime, um, we'll dig in with uh, Anitra about her experience teaching in a time of COVID. Anitra Smith-Lincoln, thank you. And, and welcome to Ask the Talks. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And we talked with with one of your fellow teachers um, at the elementary school level last week, Kara Rosenfeld, and she shared some of the experiences that that you all went through um, at Fort Bragg and and the the timing of that. And as I understand, you all went virtual starting in March of 2020. 
and ended up coming back in person in February of 2021. Yep. But you're teaching middle school um, yes. and that is a, a very different experience than, than elementary school. Can you tell us a little bit about what the virtual experience was like um, trying to teach eighth grade U.S. history over the computer? Yeah. So when we first went to virtual, it was a culture shock for everyone, Um, students, teachers, parents. um, It was, you know, unless you've taught virtual school before, it was something that most of us had never done or experienced. And so there was a quick learning curve. Um, And so we spent the first couple of weeks just as teachers trying to get acclimated to the programs that we would be using um, and trying to get the students acclimated, setting up schedules, um, and just trying to figure out what was going to be the most important thing to accomplish that year. Um, Because of course, you know, when we first um, went out, we weren't sure about what, you know, the the reach of COVID, um, how long we were going to be out. And so just trying to get acclimated to, I guess, a new world. Um, And then once we came back in August, we had a little bit of experience. Um, We did set up schedules that we thought would allow students to get the most out of the classes that they were taking, but not spend all day long sitting in front of a computer. Um, And so that was, you know, that was, Um, again, another learning curve of trying to just pare down the absolute most important information. And then also trying to keep it interesting for kids, um, trying to keep them um, engaged. You know, a lot of the um, kids, they weren't socializing with their friends. And so that time that we were on our Google Meets was their time to socialize. So we try to build in time for that as well. So it was different um, and interesting. So I'm curious at at the eighth grade level, how many students do you have at a single time? How many were you trying to instruct over? Were you using Google? We were using Google Meet um, and I had about 16 to 20 students in one session. We had some students that were not, that were opted for a a virtual academy, which meant Mm -hmm. that they were in a, a different program. So they weren't in the Google Meets. And, and you brought up a really interesting piece that, that I think we talk about, but don't always, uh, or at least think about, but maybe don't always talk about. And that's the social aspect uh, of school. And that that was hard to get in, in a larger setting. Uh, maybe people are texting, they're, they're having their own Google Meets or, or something like that. You all, it sounds like you all took that into account. How did you go about doing that? Um, so personally, when I would plan activities, I tried to do things that were going to, you know, require us talking and interacting and then even trying to pull in current events, you know, what's going on in the world today. So they could feel like um, this was a little bit of an outlet and, you know, about what they were experiencing. Um, they could see that their classmates were feeling some of the same things. You know, I had some students that their parents they didn't, they didn't go to grocery stores at all. They didn't go to restaurants. They didn't go outside. And so their only, um, ex, you know, exposure to other people was through the Google meet. And so I would just try to make sure that in, when I was planning, I allowed time that we could discuss and talk. And if we needed to go off track, we did that too. That, uh, that, that's so important because I think about the isolation that all of us tried to maintain and, then trying to add learning into that. And, and some people need that social aspect. Some of the, the kids need that social aspect and, and the discussion to help them learn. Um, so I, I think they're fortunate that they had you and your colleagues taking that into account in, in, in the learning aspect. Um, now you all returned to school in February and it was, it was not an easing back in, as I understand. We, we did, you know, some of the school districts in the Washington Metro area did a couple days a week. They did a hybrid, you know, virtual two days, in-person two days, but it was optional, but you all ripped the bandaid off, um, so to speak, over, over a weekend. What was that like returning to the classroom at the, at the middle school level? Um, it was exciting. It was scary. Um, it was, you know, just, we weren't sure what it was going to look like. Um, it was, I, f- I felt 
I personally felt that, um, you know, our, our administration at our school did everything they could to bring us back into a safe environment. Um, we had, you know, the expectation that there would be distancing and, um, you know, students and staff, everybody would wear masks. Um, classes looked a lot different. The hallways looked a lot different. The cafeteria looked a lot different. So again, it was that first couple of weeks of just trying to you know, adjust to what our new normal was going to look like. So for, for some of our listeners who may have their, their kids going back for the first time in person at the middle or high school level, can you, can you give a little more detail about how it was different? What did the classrooms look like? The hallways, I, I, I'm flashing back to high school where you would literally get pulled by a current of people in a direction you didn't want to go because there were so many of us at one time and, and lunch was 20 minutes and, and it was a quarter of the school. Um, so how did you all talk a little bit about how you managed that? Okay. So one of the things that we did at the middle school was we put our students into cohorts. So those students were with the same group of students all day long, um, which was, you know, if, That way, if you had an exposure, it was hopefully just contained to that group. So they would go to all of their classes with those students. Um, They did lunch with those students. Um, The classes were a a little bit smaller than normal because, like I said, some students chose to stay remote. Um, When they came into the classrooms, most of the classrooms before COVID were set up so that we could collaborate. We were in groups of desks. Um, When they came back, they were in individual desks that were most of the time six feet spaced apart. Um, The classrooms had been stripped of bookcases and any extra furniture so that we could, you know, make room for all the desks. Um, There was the expectation that, you know, students would stay in their desk, um, which was, I think that was an adjustment, um, especially for middle school kids, they are and really elementary, all kids, you know, it's hard to sit still. Um, and in the middle school, we do classes for an hour and a half. So it was, you know, we had to be creative and how were we going to give the kids time to get up? One thing that we did was we implemented mask breaks and that turned out to be a godsend. So (laughs) um, about mm, we did two mask breaks per period where we would take the kids outside. There was the expectation that if you were within a certain distance of each other, your mask would go on. But if you maintain distance, you could take your mask off and breathe, you know. Um, And so that was good. It also gave them time to stretch and walk around since they couldn't do it in the building. In the hallways, as you said, in middle school and high school, the hallways is where it happens, right? That's where you socialize. That's where everything. Um, It was interesting. I didn't have kids that were late to class because they weren't able to socialize as much in the hallway. There were teachers that were in the hallway that were, you know, keeping kids um, moving in the same directions. The expectation was that they would go straight from one class to another. They weren't able to stop in the bathroom. We removed the um, lockers. So they weren't, they didn't have lockers for the end of last year. Um, And I think we're actually doing that this year too. Um, And for the bathrooms, if they wanted to go to the bathroom, they had to come into class, sign out, Um, There was only a few students allowed in the bathroom at a time. That way, again, you know, if there was an exposure, we could track who was where. Um, So it was different. But I have to tell you, I think that our staff, like we just took it and went with it. And the kids, they're so resilient. They just it was a new normal, but you would not know it. They were like, okay. Hey, this is what we have to do. And, you know, there wasn't any fuss. I know personally, I thought it was going to be a, a headache to have to deal with reminding them, put on your mask, stay six feet apart. It wasn't, you know, they, they did what they were supposed to do. So it was good. I, I think that's fantastic. I think that's something that, that we're finding in the experience. You and I spoke um, before and we, we both have younger children and, and I know my, my two who are in preschool, no problem. They've been wearing masks in, for since last June. Um, and, and everybody's doing it and the teachers are doing it. And so, but I think implementing the mass break and being able to get outside, move around, especially with an hour and a half long class, that's brilliant. Um, that, that is just amazing. And, and the cohorts, um, you know, make a lot of sense. And I'm curious if you're able to share this, did you all have any exposures? And then how did you handle that? If, if a cohort had to be 
quarantined at home for a time. So we did have exposures and I think the cohort limited the amount of people that had to quarantine because um, on top of having the cohorts in the classrooms, in the cafeteria, they had seating, we had seating charts. And so if you had student A that tested positive, then our principal would look at the seating charts and see who was within um, the, you know, a radius around them, um, and then talk to that student, see, you know, um, talk to the teacher, do, were you exposed to the student? And if so, then they would, you know, um, have to quarantine at home. But I, during the entire time, I've ha I had individual students that had to come out. I never had to shut down an entire um, class, and that didn't happen on Fort Bragg at all, where we had to shut down entire schools, so... That's amazing. And it just shows the the planning that, that went into this and the dedication that, you know, the faculty and the staff and, and even the administration, of course, were, were showing as well as the students, um, you know, everybody taking this seriously. I want to come back to something. And, and this plays into a couple of things that we've talked about. You know, kids are moving from classroom to classroom, even in their cohorts. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at the seating charts and so forth. Were there sanitizing breaks? Were you furiously scrubbing down desks and chairs and door handles in the time that kids were switching classes? Or were they doing that when they came in, carrying a, light, uh, a you know, tube of Lysol wipes or something like that? So um, all of the above. <laughs> um, <laughs> the expectation was that, you know, well, first we did what we could to limit what students shared and touched with each other. Um, so there wasn't like shared colored pencils. We limited the paper that they turned in. We tried to do as much as we could on the computer. Um, books, we tried to make sure that students had their individual books. But things like desks, door handles, things of that nature. Yes, um, personally, when my students would come in, they would grab a wipe, wipe down their desk, wipe down their chair. Um, and then before they left, again, wipe down their desk, wipe down their chair. And then I would go through the room and, you know, Lysol spray and, and do that. I know that some teachers um, would take cleaning breaks, you know, when they came, when they came back in from mask break, um, do the wiping down. There was a lot of washing hands. Um, and then there, we also had um, the hand sanitizer stations set up right outside our door and right as you came into from the outside door. So, you know, students were encouraged, put on hand sanitizer, wash your hands. So yes, lots of cleaning, lots of sanitizing. Uh, that is excellent. And it sounds like everybody was adhering to that and it wasn't really disrupting the day any more than, than anything else? No, no. I, I mean, it took a couple of extra minutes before and after, but honestly, having gone through it, I think that even post COVID, I think it's something that I would probably keep up because of just germs, you yeah. know? So yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, and, and let me ask you this because you've been teaching for, um, I believe 18 years, right? Yep. So, and most of that time has been in-person instruction. All um, of it, except for last year. Except for for that, that one year. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk a, a little bit about the difference between, you know, the effectiveness of virtual instruction versus in-person instruction? And, and are, you know, are you able to catch things like learning disabilities, for instance, or, or children who maybe need an extra hand with certain topics or so forth that in in-person environment that you maybe don't notice in the virtual environment that, that, that don't come through? Um, definitely. I think that there are, are big differences, pros and cons to each. Um, we probably all agree that the connection you make with people virtually is never going to be as great as the connection you make in person, you know? Um, and so uh, the preference is in person because you are able to see more, you know, I'm able to see, um, walk around the room and, kind of see the thought processes. Um, I'm For those students that might have a, a hard time paying attention or a short attention span, I'm able to maybe bring them back a little easier. Where online, there are a lot more distract distractions, you know, um, some students, it's just they need that modeling and it's difficult to model, um, you know, things online. Um, at first, it was more difficult to come up with ways to make the material interesting. 
Um, but a couple of months into it, now that everybody in the United States was virtual, there were amazing teachers that were coming up with lessons and, you know, you could go online and you could buy these lessons or you go on Facebook groups and people would say, this is a cool activity I had to teach the civil war, you know, and it was all interactive. So then that was the, the side of it that I thought was interesting is this generation of kids loves technology. And so it was, it pushed me out of my comfort zone to start using the technology that grabbed their attention. So while I think that, you know, maybe in person, I would have been able to catch, you know, something sooner. I think that the offset was that I, I was able to learn and step out of my comfort zone and maybe grab the attention of kids that in person, they might just be bored in a classroom. Now we're bringing a computer into it. And so it's like, all right, I like this type of, you know, learning. So and, and did you find some new lessons or some new approaches to teaching that you, you've continued and adopted now that you've returned to, to in-person instruction? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we were fortunate last year that every student had a computer. And so we were able to do, you know, some stuff on the computer. Obviously, you know, you can't do everything on the computer. Um, you know, you have to, got to, you got to change it up. Yeah. But um there were some things that games that I found out, you know, the, um, games that I found that we could play or different ways that we could collaborate. Um, the kids really liked doing um, conferencing on Google Meets. And so I think that those are some things that even once we're in the building, I'll try to keep in the classroom because, again, they love technology. And if that's what they respond to, then let's pull some of it in. Yeah, that's great. Um for any parents who are listening and maybe they have kids who are going back in person to middle school or high school, maybe even to the first time to middle school or, or the high school environment. Um, do you have any advice for them? Any resources you'd point to any ways that you'd encourage them maybe to, to reach out to teachers if they have concerns. So you all are working as a team together to, to help their kids learn and grow. Um, what, what advice do you have? So my best advice is to um, be open-minded and um, understand that this is a learning process for everyone. You know, um, even though we've done this, we, we did COVID learning, um, you know, for the last, most of the last school year, um, it's still a learning process. And um, most teachers, you know, we want what we do. We want what's best for students. We want students to be safe. We want them to be healthy, but we want them to learn. Um, the classroom is going to look a lot different than when we went to school, you know. And so, just understanding that some students, um, while remote learning was great for some, some really, really struggled with it. Um, you know, some students got depressed or because, like I said, they weren't having that in-person connection, maybe they fell behind in some parts. Um, and so as a parent, as if you see that happening or if you have concerns, reach out, you know, to the teacher and see what's going on. Um, my thing is communication. Communication is, you know, never assume. Um, there's no question that's, that's you know, dumb. Um, and there's not ever, there's never too many emails. I have parents that will say, I don't want to bother you. And I'm like, bother me. I'd rather you email me and ask me the question than not be, you know, not be aware of it or not sure of what's going on. Middle school is a hard time anyway with everything else. And then when you add in COVID, you know, it's, it makes it even more. So I, we definitely have to work as a team and just know that we want what's best for your kids. We want them to stay healthy and we, we're going to do everything we can to help them learn through this. That's excellent. Thank you very much. Any, any final thoughts that you'd like to share? Um, just thank you for having me. Um, hopefully this year we start to get back to a little bit of normalcy, but I'm excited to start the school year and see what it holds. Well, and good luck to you and, and you. your fellow teachers um, as the school year starts very soon for you all. What, what's the start date? Um, teachers go back on Monday and students come back the following week. All right. So when you're hearing this, Anitra will be back in the classroom getting ready for her students to come back on the 23rd. So Anitra, thank you so much for taking time today to, to share your experience and your advice with us and your expertise um, and, and for spending this time with us. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Ask for Talks, a production of the American Foreign Service Protective Association. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show and tell your friends about it. We welcome your feedback on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Look for at Ask the Cares. All information offered in this podcast is meant to be educational. Comments offered by the hosts or guests are not intended as medical advice. Please direct questions about your personal health needs to a provider. Should there be any discrepancy between information offered in this podcast and official plan documents for the Foreign Service Benefit Plan or other products offered by ASPA, the policy provisions will prevail. Special thanks as always to Hannah Wolfhart for producing, editing, and mixing this episode. We'll see you next time.